Blog Talk Radio, the world's largest online radio network. Welcome to World Footprints Radio, the show where we celebrate responsible travel, culture, and heritage. Featuring your hosts, Tanya and Ian Fitzpatrick. Now, World Footprints Radio. Join us as we go to the mat with some of Paralympic Judo's top athletes and share one man's quest to make this sport a force for changing lives and perceptions of the blind and visually impaired community. Hello, everyone. Thank you for tuning in to World Footprints, the leading voice in socially responsible travel and lifestyle. I'm Tanya Fitzpatrick, along with my husband, Ian, and we're spotlighting the sport of Paralympic Judo and some amazing ambassadors of the sport. Thanks, dear. Jordan Mouton knew that she was cut out for Judo when she pinned her first opponent, a wrestler twice her size. Now, Jordan is London-bound as a member of the 2012 Paralympic Judo team, Jordan joins us to share her journey in her quest for Olympic gold. I'm lucky enough to be able to have a spot at the Olympic Training Center to train. And so I put off school and everything um, to train specifically for this because I knew it's what I wanted to do. Lori Pierce is a Paralympic trailblazer for athletes like Jordan. As the First Lady of Paralympic Judo, Lori was the first ever and only female of the 2004 U.S. Paralympic Judo team. Now Lori is one of Judo's ambassadors and stops by to share her plans to return to the international stage in the near future. I really want to get back into the sport because I, I really do miss it and I think it you know, uh, brings a lot of, you know, uh, it helps me with my self-esteem and self-confidence and I think it's you know, important to be able to build those, you know, foundations that I had from Judo before. Global citizen and businessman Ron Peck has poured his heart and soul into creating opportunities for the blind and visually impaired in the sport of Judo. Ron is the founder of the Blind Judo Foundation, which is opening doors for the blind and visually impaired judokas from beginners to those starring on the world and Olympic stage. Getting involved with a sport like Judo, it's so attuned to blind and visually impaired. Even sighted people say, once you grab a hold of, of the other person's judo uniform called the judo gi, it, you're on. I mean, it, it has nothing to do with sight. It's all about feel. I'm Ian Fitzpatrick, and along with my wife, Tanya, this is World Footprints. Visit and connect with us at worldfootprints.com. Some athletes find their niche when they spike their first volleyball or clock a personal record on the track. Jordan Mouton knew that she was cut out for judo when she pinned her first opponent, a wrestler twice her size. Now, Jordan is London-bound as a member of the 2012 U.S. Paralympic Judo team. She's taking some time out of her training schedule to join us today. Jordan, welcome. Thank you for having me. You are the only female member on the 2008 Beijing Paralympic Judo team. What was that experience like for you? Um, the Beijing Paralympics was a very neat experience for me, and being the only female, uh, it was a little nerve-wracking because I was always surrounded by guys, but i um, kind of used to that because my whole family is. So, uh, <laughs> but it was a really neat experience because, uh, you know, I was, I was pretty new to the sport. I had no idea what to expect, and so it was just, I don't know, it was, it was definitely really cool. But being the only female, it didn't, it didn't phase me too much. Now, how did you discover judo? I discovered judo because I was so into sports as a, a young kid, and when I started to lose my vision, I, you know, went and searched for a sport that I could play with the limited vision that I had. So I went to a sports camp for blind athletes in Colorado Springs, and they were showing a couple of different sports that were really good for blind athletes to do, and one of them was judo, and they took us to the Olympic Training Center in Colorado Springs. And uh, when we were there, it just so happened to be that the U.S. Paralympic team at the time was having a camp up there. So we got to meet the players and the coach. And um, I just really took to it and enjoyed the sport because I'm an aggressive person, and it was an aggressive sport. Mm -hmm. but, um, Jordan, how old were you when you started to lose your vision? I was eight when I was diagnosed with um, my condition, but it didn't really start to affect me until I was 12. Mm -hmm. 
From then on, it just slowly decreased, and I was completely blind by 19. You know, I was thinking about the sport of of judo, and it's uh, very much a sensory sport, I think. And so judo is actually, um, I think, maybe one of the reasons why it's been identified as um, you know, a um, an excellent sport for visually impaired or um, blind is because it is so sensory. Would you agree with that? Oh yes, ma'am, definitely. Mm-hmm. And, and what what do you say to people who may underestimate your abilities because you're you're blind? Um, what I say to those people is just you know don't don't judge a book by its cover until you get to really know them or see them because um you know just you never know what somebody's capable of or Mm -hmm. or, and and i think because you use so many of your senses you know you have a better advantage and i remember um talking to ron peck a few weeks ago and he told me a story about um somebody who approached him uh he had a um uh, a student from the Blind Foundation um, in a competition against a uh, sighted person, and somebody made the comment, you know, oh, you're not being fair. And Ron stood back and he said, yeah, you know, I think it is uh, at a disadvantage for the sighted the sighted person. Um, <laughs> and I've always loved that story because, you know, it, it essentially um, you you can't. Uh, you know, there, there can't be any preconceived notions, and because judo is so sensory and you have such a feel, um, you know, you get to, um, you know where things are. You you can sense, you know, motions and, and what have you. Um, so, uh, you know, if, and Ron Peck has, you know, done a wonderful thing with the um, uh, the Blind Judo Foundation and, and founding that, and I think that's, you know, provided a wonderful support for, for you guys. Um, now, you're training for the world stage. How do you balance your training and other responsibilities? I and mean, what's your day-to-day schedule like? Well, um, the balance is pretty easy for me because I'm lucky enough to be able to have a spot at the Olympic Training Center to train. And so I put off school and everything um, to train specifically for this because I knew it's what I wanted to do. So, um, you know, our, our daily schedule is pretty, you just, we have our morning workouts and we have a cardio session and then we get a, a midday session in and then the evening judo practice. So it's um it's a very in- intense uh, training schedule, but mm-hmm. uh, I'm, me and a couple of the other teammates, we're lucky enough to be at the Olympic Training Center, so it, it g- takes a little stress off of our day-to-day responsibilities because we get to do that. But mm-hmm. before I went there, it was it was kind of difficult. I was still going to school, and you know I had responsibilities at home, and I was just constantly stressed and had so much it, to do. Is, is judo a sport that is? Um, do you have weight classes in judo like you do with wrestling? Yes. Okay. Okay, um, because I remember, you know, Ian mentioned that you actually pinned your first opponent, who was twice your size. So I was just wondering if there are those weight classes. There are, but sometimes we can fight up, or we can um, practice with people bigger. Or just uh, I, I actually for Beijing, I went up a couple weight classes to fight off because I really wanted to go. Mm-hmm. So uh, I went up a couple weight classes, so I was a little smaller than all the other opponents. Now, Jordan, this time around for the London Games, are there any females joining you on the team this time? Yes, sir. There's actually three of us this time. There's um, two other females on the team, which I'm very excited about. Now, most of your training regimen, is it is it is it done uh, fighting other women or are you fighting men as well? Um, in practice, we mostly try to fight women um, because we have a little bit of a different style than the men. But we also practice with um, men sometimes. Like I said, I'm at the training Olympic Training Center, and we uh, I fight with the national judo team, the sighted national team. So I fight with sighted people, and they're both women and men. But they like us to stick with people our size when we're training. Hmm. 
Now, you've had a chance to appear on Oprah, and you've met some pretty famous people like Ashton Kutcher. Were you nervous? <laughs> I was very nervous. Um, if anybody sees the show, they'll be able to tell that in a heartbeat. <laughs> <laughs> kind of your 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 uh, your heart throb there. <laughs> yeah, and I was 15, and um, you know, I've just I've had some very lucky experiences in my life because that was before I even started judo. Wow. So so how did that nervousness, you know, I know you get nervous, you know, there's you fight nerves before a competition. How did that compare to, you know, um competing on the global stage for you? Uh that's hard to say cuz uh you know, in judo when you get nervous, they say it's good to be nervous cuz you channel that nervousness when you get out on the mat and use it um, you know, as motivation or in your fight, but um, going out on the stage to be on national TV on Oprah, that was just like a terrifying nervousness, like, oh, what if I fall off the stage, or what if I do this, or look stupid, it's just, it's a whole other kind of nervous. Mm. And and how was it meeting Ashton Kutcher? Oh, it was great, he's a, he's a very nice, down-to-earth guy, and it was, um, you know, it was just a real neat thing. <laughs> Your story is so um, inspirational, Jordan. What what would you say to a listener who wants to do something more with their life, um, but are afraid to to even go outside of the box? I mean, there are some people who won't compete in anything because they're afraid of losing, or you know, afraid of um, of uh, looking silly. You know, I mean, people, fear is such a, a, a huge negative motivating factor for many people um, to do nothing. What would you say to them? Um, well, you know, I, fear is a really negative thing, and I have to be honest. I, When I first started losing my sight, I had a lot of fears, and they did hold me back for a little while. But you kind of just, you just, you have to... It really comes down to digging down deep and finding that little motivation inside of you and just being strong enough to pull it out and use it. And you just have to, no matter if you're scared and you're sitting on the couch inside saying, oh, I can't go do this, I just can't, because you're too scared of what's going to happen, you just have to make yourself just get up and go do it. That's really all it comes down to. And uh, it's going to be terrifying and it's going to be nerve-wracking and but you just have to make yourself get out there and do it and keep on doing it even if you fail and uh, it doesn't happen exactly how you want it at first because, you know, you can do it. And there's there's me that can prove that and there's thousands of other people out there mm-hmm. that can prove that. You just have to keep pushing forward. It's like anything in life. You know, somebody that doesn't have a disability, you're going to fail at many things before you succeed. So. Mm-hmm. Right. Jordan, I've been curious. We've had a chance to talk to a number of Paralympians, and each person has a tremendous story to tell of overcoming something that they've lost about their physical self. And I'm curious for for yourself, has the loss of your sight uh, changed how you approach your athletic competition and that... uh, are you drawing deeper and perhaps having different motivations than, let's say, sighted uh, athletes would have who may not necessarily have to overcome uh, that? And and I'm just wondering, does that give you just a different appreciation or actually just make you a better athlete? I think so. I, I think it gives me a better appreciation because, um, like I said, when I was younger I could see and I did sports and I was just, naturally good at them so I didn't have to work as hard and it just you don't appreciate what you're doing but now that I can't see I have to work twice as hard at everything I do so it's just it's given me a little bit of a a higher motivation a stronger um, you know admiration for what other people do and how hard they work and how hard I have to push myself to get to where I want to be and uh I think it made me an all-around better person because I just I had to stand up and work harder at things and just uh, push myself more. And um, so it it definitely has humbled me and made me a better person all around to have to do that. 
Mm-hmm. Now, you know, I, I know London is coming up, and I don't want to go too far beyond London, but I'm wondering if you've actually thought about um, what's next for you beyond London and what some of your long-term goals are. Um, I don't know if there's too many, you know, 50-, 60-year-old um, judo athletes on the U.S. Olympic team. <laughs> and so have you started to think about what you want to do beyond uh, the Olympic Games? Um, like you said, I haven't thought too much past London because that's my goal right now. But I do know that I'm going to go to school, going to go finish school right after London mm-hmm. and take some time off. And uh, I couldn't tell you yes or no for sure if I'm going to continue on this level, like try to make it to the 2016 games or not. Um, I'll probably decide that after my performance in London. Mm-hmm. But I will definitely always um, do judo. It'll always be a part of my life, whether I'm teaching or helping other blind kids or something. Um, you know, if I don't continue at this level, it'll always be in my life. So. Well, we we certainly hope so. And you know, Ian and I um, plan to be in London for the Paralympic. Uh, games and we're you know we're really excited that we're going to have a lot of new friends that you know will be on the sidelines. I guess as a journalist, you're not supposed to up, jump up and joy or jump up and down and cheer somebody on. I mean it's kind of a journalism faux pas, but um, but I will be, <laughs> we will be secretly, and I'll certainly you know be watching watching for you and and I, I look forward to the opportunity to meet you personally. Um, and, and certainly be there to uh, to witness your performance and, and kind of cheer you on. You'll you'll kind of hear us on the sideline, <laughs> one way or the other. <laughs> um, but, but Jordan, it, it's been such a pleasure to have you on. I mean, you're 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 very inspirational and a beautiful young lady, and um, we just look forward to watching you evolve and, and grow throughout the years and uh, certainly in the immediate future is seeing you in, in London. So thank you so much for joining us today on World Footprints. Oh, thank you. It's my pleasure. It would be good to get to meet you in London. Coming up, Paralympic Judo's First Lady, Lori Pierce. I really want to get back into the sport because I, I really do miss it and I think it you know, uh, brings a lot of, you know, uh, it helps me with my self-esteem and self-confidence and I think it has you know, important, you know, just need to build those little foundations that I had from judo before. Next, as World Footprints continues. Hi, my name is Asatui Nishara. I am from Samoa, and I really love the World Footprints radio, and I love this family that talks to me like friends to me. Looking for a great gift for Dad on Father's Day? Then please consider NationwideMall.com, America's online shopping mall. NationwideMall.com has a huge number of retail stores to shop. Whether you're looking for fishing gear, tools, golf, hiking gear, or just about any other gift, you'll find it at NationwideMall.com. Our retailers have many years of experience in helping you find just the right gift for Dad. That's NationwideMall.com, America's online shopping mall. Don't have the time to give back to the community? No time to socialize or network? Then volunteer with One Brick. Volunteer only when it fits your schedule, and then join us for food, drinks, and great conversation afterwards. It's a great way to meet new people, have fun, and help the community. Join us at www.onebrick.org. That's www.onebrick.org. One Brick. Volunteering made easy. Hi, I'm Patricia Elsey from Mother's Restaurant, and I'm sitting here with the famous World Footprints radio people, Tanya and Ian, (laughs) and they love our cooking, and they're really enjoying the food, and I love them, and I hope they come back again. You're listening to World Footprints Radio, awarded as the best travel audio podcast by the North American Travel Journalists Association. Here's Tanya and Ian Fitzpatrick. Welcome back to World Footprints. I'm Tony Fitzpatrick. Lori Pierce is a powerhouse first-class athlete. She was the first female on the 2004 U.S. Paralympic judo team, the only female on the judo team, and the first to represent the USA in Paralympic judo 
at the 2004 Games in Athens. She has won multiple international medals, and although she is not competing in the London 2012 Games, Lori is promoting the sport of judo, and she plans to return to the international stage in the near future. And before that happens, she's taking time out to join us today on World Footprints. Lori, thank you so much for, for joining us. Thank you for having me. It's our pleasure. Now, did you make the, the conscious decision not to compete in, in London, and, and, and why? Why or why not? Um, I did. I actually um, took time off from um, judo to uh, further my um, education. I just recently graduated uh, from the University of Texas at Austin um, with my um, bachelor's degree in psychology. Wow. Congratulations. Thank you. So you you grew up, though, playing in a number of sports. How did you discover the sport of judo, and what is it about judo that really resonated with you? I, um, I grew up playing different sports, and with judo, I liked the fact that you could, um, you know, compete against sighted uh, competitors, and there wasn't a lot of adaptation to the sport of judo. Um, you have a lot of other sports uh, specifically adapted for the blind, and so and those have a lot of adaptation for the blind, visually impaired uh, people to be able to play, and judo doesn't really have a lot of the adaptation. Mm-hmm. And, I mean, judo seems to be um, an ideal sport, I think, for the visually impaired and blind because, to me, it seems like a very sensory sport. I mean, you have to use in... in you know, perhaps, uh, or specifically when, you know, if you're blind or visually impaired, you're really tapping into all of your senses. And in some ways, I think that gives you a greater advantage than it does to um, sighted competitors. But I think so. I think judo is a very good uh, sport or recreational sport or, you know, if you want to do the international or national um, route. Because it is, like you say, it is uh, tapping into all your sensory um, sensory uh, feel and everything like that. So I think it's very important. It's about judo is all about touch and knowing where your opponent is and being able to feel what their movements are in comparison to your own. Mm-hmm. Um, now I know you can com- you competed in uh, 2002 uh, in the Blind World Championship in Rome. Um, was that the first time you competed on the international stage? Yes, I, that was, uh, in Rome was the first time I competed internationally. And and how how was that for you? What was that experience? Uh, it was like? very it was very nerve wracking, but it was really really cool to be able to you know represent the United States in a international tournament. Um, being 16, I I never had traveled outside of the country or out of the country before. So that was really really cool to be able to. Um, represent the United States, and my uh, dad got to come on the trip as well, so that was really um, neat for him to be able to see me compete on that at an international tournament. Mm-hmm. And, and you've competed in, in uh, several other international um, tournaments as well. Is there one one tournament that really stands out for you? Um, I'd have to say uh, um, Athens, Greece for the 2004 Paralympics. Um, that was, I think, my most memorable um, tournament. I was able to compete in. And why why is it so memorable for you? Um, I think just, uh, you know, being able to represent the United States and being the only female on the judo team, you know, it was really kind of cool to be able to um, go and represent the United States and be the first, you know, uh, blind uh, judo athlete to represent uh, the United States. Mm Mm-hmm. When when you when you travel um, with you know the teams and and when you compete overseas, do you? I know there's a lot of security surrounding the athletes um, in any games, you know, whether it be the Olympic Games or other World Championships. But do you ever have an opportunity um, to experience the country or destination that you're traveling to, particularly with your family, as they tend to travel with you? Um, I actually, when I, we were in um, Athens, my uh, mom and dad got to come with us um, to Athens, and they, they, they didn't fly with us with the team, but they were able to make it to Athens to see me compete. And yeah, we actually were able to go and uh, see the Acropolis in Greece and, you know, uh, go shopping um, in the outdoor malls and things like that. And one of, um, one of me and my uh, teammate, after competition was over when we were in Greece, we were able to catch the public transportation and go by ourselves into a, you know, into a, a shopping area, and that was really, really fun because we were able to, you know, ask the locals, you know, what places are good, mm-hmm. what places were, you know, nice to try, and 
they were really, really receptive and really friendly. Um, they, if they didn't know English, you know, they, they would find someone that could help us and tell us, you know, it's the best way to go or what uh, the best, you know, sight seeing type things to see. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And and what about um, you know some of the different places that you, you've been? Is there one that really resonates with you, or one that's very transformative um, for you, or has been transformative for you? I think all the places we have. I've been to um, uh, Rome, Italy, and Quebec, Canada, and France, and Brazil, and Greece, and England. Oh, I think all of them have been really, really um, you know, transformative for me to see. I get you know see all these different places, and I don't know a lot of people you know that get to go you know the, all, to all these different places um, to be able to do, to do something that you know you're really, really passionate about, like judo. And you know, I don't know a lot of people that are able to say that they've done that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and, you know, one of the things that we really talk about, you know, on our show a lot is the, the power of travel and, you know, how that enriches you as as a person and, you know, the experience, the education, just from, you know, being around other cultures, immersing yourself in those um, cultures. And I'm glad to know that you've had opportunities to really um, experience, you know, have the, those authentic and experiential um opportunities when you travel, uh, even in competition. So that that's a nice surprise to hear that, you know, you, you do have that freedom uh, to, to travel after the games and after the competition. So you, um, I mean, you're not competing for, for London this year. Are you preparing for a... Um, a uh, future competition? Yeah, I'd really like to get back into uh, judo on an um, international competitive level. Um, I think that's my next goal to, to figure out a way to you know, get you know back into the international national um, judo circuit. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, and are you currently training for um, a future competition? I mean, have you identified what com- uh, what event you want to compete in, and, and are you training for that now? I haven't identified what is that. Uh, I'm just trying to, you know, get back into um, judo. Um, you know, I've taken a break, and so I'm trying to get back into, you know, judo as a whole. And I haven't really figured out what competition I want to, you know, figure out, you know, what competition I want to try for quite yet. Mm-hmm. I really want to get back into the sport because I, I really do miss it, and I think it, you know, uh, brings a lot of, you know, uh, it helps me with my self-esteem and self-confidence, and I think that that's, you know, important you know, continue to build those, you know, foundations that I had from judo before. Sure. And, and you're teaching uh, judo to children now. Are you teaching both sighted and visually impaired children the sport? I'm currently teaching at the School for the Blind in Austin, Texas. Um, and so right now it's just teaching blind visually impaired youth. Mm-hmm. But I have um, helped out uh, to teach uh, sighted and um, blind visually impaired um, children. Okay. Before. And what is the most important life lesson you try to teach uh, the children you interact with? I try to teach them to, you know, uh, to you know, set goals and to be able to, you know, achieve those goals and, you know, to increase their self-esteem and increase their self-confidence and increase, you know, their their ability of thinking, you know, I, I can do these sports like my friends do, you know, because, a lot of blind vision impaired um, kids don't think they can do a lot of these different sports um, just because they've never they never played those sports before, and their you know their parents are sort of telling them you know that you know maybe they wouldn't be able to because they can't see. And I think that's the biggest um, thing I'd like to you know try and teach uh, the students that I work with is that you know that you can you can do what you set your mind to do. I mean you just have to do it a little bit differently possibly, but. So you, know, you can do anything you want to do, um, mm-hmm. whether it's you know, school or sports or you know music. You know, I think that that's important for people to understand. Even though they're blind or visually impaired, they're able to set you know set their goals and be able to achieve them. Right, and I know you know you're a wonderful role model for them. I mean, you were um, uh, you were born without sight, correct? And so you've actually everything you've achieved. You know, you haven't had to rely on vision to achieve the the goals and the, the accomplishments that you've you've uh, experienced. Right. Yeah, I was um, born uh, three months premature, and um, so I had too much too much oxygen on my eyes, um, 
and they were trying to, you know, um, so I was very, very small. And so that was uh, the cause of my blindness. Hmm. Yeah, so, and Lori, uh, I know you've graduated from college. You're teaching uh, judo. You want to get back into um, the sport, into competing. But um, what are some of your longer-term goals? Um, are you thinking about graduate school, or have you thought about the type of um, long-term career you want to pursue? Um, I have thought about uh, trying to get my teaching certificate um, to be able to teach. But I guess a long-term goal would be to um, either go into teaching or to go into um, counseling. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That would act, I mean that that would be um, wonderful. And I, I know you know again you're such an inspiration. Your story, your you. uh, ability to just you know overcome um, adversity uh, and you know obstacles rather. And um, I, I think that would be um, that would just be a wonderful gift. Um, that that you'd be able to share. Yeah, your your story's beautiful, and I, I thank you so much you're for. <laughs> you're welcome. Thank you for for sharing that um, with us on on World Footprints, and we certainly look forward to following your career progression. And certainly, um, I will ask uh, Ron Peck with the Blind Doodle uh, Foundation um, when you do start competing. Um, one of you guys, I would love for one of you guys to uh, to let us know so that we can follow your progress on uh, on the um, the circuit. Yeah, we definitely will. And um, about you mentioned the Blind Judo Foundation, um, they're extremely instrumental at you know helping um, blind visually impaired you know people in to get into the sport of judo. And then once they're they are involved in judo, they're extremely instrumental at you know helping them find um, these different activities, these different, you know, sporting uh, uh, tournaments that we were able to attend because the, um, you know, uh, Paralympic, uh, you know, athletes, they do not get uh, funding. You know, the, the, the regular Olympics, the athletes get a lot of funding. Mm-hmm. Whereas the Paralympic judo, you know, or any, I, I just know about judo, uh, they don't get um, a lot of funding. So the Blind Judo Foundation is extremely helpful in, you know, helping you to um, offset those, those costs a little bit. So that's extremely helpful and very, very cool. Yeah, and, and we're certainly um, supportive of the Blind Judo Foundation. Um, and, you know, we'll hope to, through this show, raise um, more awareness about the Paralympic Games and um, uh, generate uh, a lot more excitement, uh, even in the major media, um, than has been shown. And so, uh, we're trying to do our little part here. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, oh, it's been a pleasure. And I, you know, I just thought of one other quick question. Um, when we were talking earlier on, you mentioned you know judo is one of the the sports that's been identified as um, kind of a non uh, adaptive sport. What are some of the other ones that you know that someone in our audience may be uh, listening as they're listening to this? Uh, you know, may be considering putting their child in or joining. Um, a sports organization. What other sports would would be ideal or would be beneficial for um, somebody to look into for you know a child or themselves uh, who you know are wanting to participate? Um, as I said, you know, judo doesn't have a lot of adaptations. I mean, there, there are little bit, you know, little small things. Um, so for example, you know, having constant contact with your opponent. Um, in regards to other sports that they could do, um, wrestling, uh, again, doesn't have a lot of adaptation, and swimming and track and field uh, mm-hmm. doesn't have a lot of adaptation. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you so much for sharing, Lori, and thank you again for your story, and uh, we look forward to meeting you again. Yeah, thank you very much for having me on your show. Our pleasure. After the break, Ron Peck of the Blind Judo Foundation and the efforts to expand access to judo for the blind. Getting involved with a sport like judo, it's so attuned to blind and visually impaired. Even sighted people say, once you grab a hold of of the other person's judo uniform called the judo gi, you're on. I mean, it it has nothing to do with sight. It's all about feel. Next, as World Footprints continues. Hi, this is Chantel from New Orleans. I love WorldFootprintsRadio.com. You guys rock. Are you planning a vacation, a business trip, or a honeymoon abroad? 
Want to enhance your trip and make a meaningful contribution to the places you visit? Packforapurpose.org can show you how. Before you travel, visit Packforapurpose.org. It's easy to make a big impact. This is Rebecca Rothney with Packforapurpose.org, and I love the meaningful travel that World Footprints inspires. And now, more of World Footprints Radio with your hosts, Tanya and Ian Fitzpatrick. Welcome back to World Footprints. I'm Tanya Fitzpatrick. Ron Peck is a true ambassador for global citizenship. This incredibly successful businessman followed his heart and poured his soul into creating opportunities for others. Ron is the founder of the Blind Judo Foundation, an organization that is opening up opportunities for blind and visually impaired athletes to pursue their dreams. Many of those athletes find their way to the international stage, including the Olympics. Why did Ron leave corporate America? We'll find out why. Ron, welcome. Well, thank you, Tanya and Ian, for having me. I'm, I'm very privileged to be among the group that you're interviewing and talking about in World Footprints. I'd like to know about that aha moment that inspired you to take a break from your successful corporate ventures to uh, found the Blind Judo Foundation. I came back to the West Coast, and I work out you know, four or five days a week, and I had met an individual there, and I hadn't seen him for a while. And he said, uh, or I said, Willie, and he's the uh, uh, co-founder of the Blind Judo Foundation along with myself. I said, where you been? He said, I was in Vegas. And he goes on to talk about it. I said, what were you doing there? And he talked about his athletes and winning awards and medals and so forth. And at the end he said, oh, by the way, they're all blind and visually impaired. Well, I actually got teary-eyed because I did judo in college, didn't do well, uh, got into uh, different martial arts years later and did a lot better. And I start questioning about it, and he says, yeah, in fact, uh, many of them are going to go to the Paralympics. And he right. goes on to explain the Paralympics. And I said, well, you know, i, I got to tell you, I've never heard of this. And I said, but that's okay. If, if I didn't hear of it, doesn't mean it doesn't exist. But tell me a little bit about the Paralympics. And he goes into it and shares some information. And I said, oh, well, they must get the same support and media coverage and financial support and recognition and so forth as regular Olympians. And he said, not really. And there wasn't any one particular organization focused on blind and visually impaired. And, and how long was ago a, was that? that? That was back in 2003, 2003. And it's interesting, the, uh, the IRS called me up after about uh, five, six months or so, and they said, okay, what are you guys trying to pull? I said, excuse me? Oh, for heaven's sakes. Blind people don't do judo. What's this, what's this all about? And I said, uh, well, it's about blind people doing judo, and <laughs> I go into an explanation. And I said, well, let me let me just send you some documentation, some you know support material, and so forth. In any case, it took us 11 months just to get the 501c3. But that's the problem in the U.S. Paralympics is equal to, in people's mind, in saying Special Olympics, mm. and it isn't. There's nothing cognitive wrong. Uh, with our athletes. It's all physical, in this case, blind or visually impaired. Uh, but most Americans don't know that, and that's part of the, you know, find a need and fill it, right. the aha moment in creating this, because I said, this, this can't be. They have to meet all the same requirements. Everything is the same, except in this case, at the Olympic slash Paralympic level. Uh, a, a blind person or visually impaired competes with a blind person or visually impaired, even though in other tournaments we put blind against sighted, which mm -hmm. is, is not cruel at all. It was interesting. A lady came up to me and said, we, we had a, a, a blind uh, female uh, athlete out competing with a blind or with a sighted uh, judo player. And this lady said, uh, it's kind of cruel, isn't it? I said, what? what's cruel? Well, putting that, that uh, blind person with the sighted person, I hesitated for a little bit, and I said, yeah, it is kind of tough on that sighted person. <laughs> you know, I I actually shared that story when I was um, interviewing, um, uh, might have been Jordan, or Lori, it was Lori, actually. I actually shared that story with her, and I, I mean, I find that uh, 
very comical, and um, it is. <laughs> from what I know about you, I can see you saying that, you know, and saying it with a straight face. Yeah, oh, I did. Yeah, because I go, yeah, it is kind of cruel on that sided person. In fact, you know, it was it was actually Lori. Now that I, re- I remember this story, it was actually Lori that was out on the mat. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, she's a sweetheart. Oh. I'll tell you, she will, not intentionally, but she'll bring tears to your eyes and and warmth to your heart just to see this young lady perform. And I've spoken to her mother uh, and and father many times, and her mother told me one time, she said, you know, ever since she's born and could talk, she's never said, why me? Mm Mm-hmm. You know, um, I I enjoy talking to to Lori Pierce, and I know, you know, she... Um, we're gonna miss uh, seeing her at the uh, the 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 games in London, mm-hmm. um, but you know she is doing a lot of wonderful work with um, blind students. But you know she has her legacy. You know is that she was the only female on the judo team and the first to represent the USA in um, uh, the 2004 on the Paralympic judo team in uh, the 2000 uh, Athens 2004 yes. Athens games. Yep. Which yep. was uh, which was a landmark, and so I know your your organization had a lot to to do with that, um, and and just uh, you know just uh, propelling her forward. And I know Ron, you have a lot of you know wonderful stories about the students you've trained. You, you've helped train. You've helped support. Um, you know a number of uh, of students who have gone on to the international stage, and um, yes. we talked a little bit about. Uh, Lori Pierce, um, Jordan Mouton, who is representing uh, the 2012 mm-hmm. team, uh, Paralympic judo team this year, um, but in, in two wonderful young li- women that we have interviewed. Um, what are some of the other, some of your other favorite student success stories? Well, there's a, there's another one. That each one, by the way, has a story, uh, unintentional, but they have a story. And there was an individual, a young man that I'm thinking of that uh, I don't know that I will mention his name, but uh, he's on the uh, this year's team, the 2012 uh, team going to the U.K. And he's from a uh, small town in, um, in Kansas, in the Midwest, and the parents were uh, having difficulties and so forth, so he moved out to his grandma's house. And... Uh, he doesn't come from money, nor does his grandmother have any money. And this young man, we got him accepted and, and lives at the Olympic Training Center in Colorado Springs, Colorado. And he is so dedicated uh, to competing and winning that goal that he's now been accepted. There's no doubt about it. He's on the current U.S. Paralympic Judo team heading to the U.K. in August of this year. Mm. And his story is just in- inspiring I remember a time where he hadn't uh, been estranged from his dad for a long time, so he called him up because uh, we had him in a tournament in Dallas, Texas. And he called up his dad and never got through to him but left a message, probably something to the effect of, hey, Dad, I'm going to be down in Dallas and would like to see you and so forth. Well, it turns out the dad met up with him at that tournament in Dallas and spent the day with him and the evening in his hotel room. He mm-hmm. stayed overnight with his son. And there's just so many stories, uh, Tanya and Ian, that it's just, it's, it's wonderful to see these, I call them kids, uh, uh, you know, they're in their 20s and, and so forth, uh, but just really come alive because, you know, judo is not about what color is your belt, what trophy did you win, what medal did you get, are you going to the Paralympics or not? I mean, these are important, obviously, mm-hmm. but it's about learning what I call the tenets of judo. And everybody are after the tenets, which I succinctly put it down to six uh, categories. Confidence, how to build confidence. How to make a commitment and follow through. How to build character, humility, respect, and responsibility. That's what judo teaches. Yes, there's other byproducts of it and so forth. A lot of times when I give talks to, um, to parents, they say, well, just a minute. Is it judo about falling? Oh, yeah, it's about falling. But what better way to learn how to fall than to learn it through the sport of judo? And even if if an individual gets in from the standpoint of an exercise program, no interest in competing and so forth, it's not about going to the Paralympics. 
It's about building these skill sets and confidence and character and humility and, and so on and so forth, the tenets of judo. Well, well Ron, one of, the, one of the things that I think makes judo interesting, at, at least from my perspective, particularly as we talk about uh, uh, blind participants versus those who can see, that mm -hmm. there's this equal footing, in a sense, that they can both compete. And there are very few instances in athletics where we see that happen. Yes. And why? What is, what is it about judo that really allows someone who's blind to really compete with someone who can see and apparently has an advantage when, um, you know, the other person who, who can't see would seemingly be at a disadvantage. What is it about the sport? Yeah, that's a great question, Ian. Uh, let's, let's take a look at the junior high and high school. Let's say uh, one was blind or visually impaired. What happens in, in physical education? Let's just take one of the classes that one goes through in, in junior high or high school. What typically happens is that that visually impaired student is told by the coach, why don't you just sit over there in the bleachers, you know, do some of your homework and so forth. I'll, I'll give you a C, but, you know, take care of yourself that way. Well, when you think about that, what, what kind of lesson is learned by that visually imper impaired person? Gee, I'm not quite as good as somebody else. I don't have capabilities. Yeah, I'm blind, so I guess I can't excel. And it's really a negative effect on an individual's psyche and future. Well, if you can't do that, maybe you can't go to college. Maybe you can't be good in math. Maybe you can't be good in a lot of things. When, in fact, that's not true. And consequently, getting involved with a sport like judo, it's so attuned to blind and visually impaired. Even sighted people say, once you grab a hold of, of the other person's judo uniform called the judo gi, it, you're on. I mean, it, it has nothing to do with sight. It's all about feel. Are you going to get a, a, a foot sweep? Are you going to get thrown? You're going to, you know, what's coming up and so forth. Very tactile. Mm -hmm. And then when you get to the mat, that's grappling. What is grappling? It's wrestling. And so that's, that visually impaired person says, well, gee, if I can do judo and get recognition there, I wonder what else I could really do and not let something like visual impairment stop me. Granted, they can't be a surgeon and, and fly a plane and a lot of other things, but there's so much one can do building on the skills that they have that this sport really focuses an individual and you don't have to compete at a Paralympic level or go to tournaments you gain this by showing up two to three times a week on a consistent basis hmm. it's wonderful it, it truly is is powerful to think how this sport can just change the lives of uh, folks who've been put to the sidelines because they can't see and, and I yes. think that that's just one of the great things about it and it's unfortunate, um, especially for our military men and women that are coming back, according to the uh, one organization that's the only organization recognized by the VA, 13% of our returning military men and women have become blind or visually impaired, some sort of eye issues. Mm -hmm. Well, you can imagine coming back now, well, what do I do? I'm, I'm useless. You know, I have no skills. I can't see or whatever the case might be. And what we are doing is reaching out to that community also to say, hey, you're okay, it's unfortunate, but let's get, get you involved with judo. Because remember, it goes back to not what color is your belt, but building confidence and enhancing independence. Why did you leave corporate America? And um, what has been you know, a very inspirational moment or transformative moment for you to help you make that decision to walk away from, from corporate America? With all those years of experience, I, I felt it was time to do something else, to reach out and take whatever skills I might have acquired along the way, with whether it's people, organization, or, or whatever it might be, and to make a difference. And I'll tell you, uh, I was taking a course, I didn't share this at the beginning, called Landmark Education. I don't know if you've heard them or not, but basically it takes you three years to get to this one particular program, or almost three years. You end up being there three years. called Self-Expression Leadership Program. 
or S-E-L-P. Mm-hmm. And taking that course, one of the things that you have to do to graduate from it is you have to create something and give it away. And I'm thinking, what, what could that be? Well, that's at the time, going back in our early part of our conversation, where I had met Willie Cahill, um, my business partner and co-founder of the foundation. And uh, I thought, well, let's create this foundation, but then I have to give it away? <laughs> <laughs> and, I mean, who better to give it away to, to, to a guy that's a 10th degree black belt in jiu-jitsu, 8th in judo, trains Navy SEALs, U.S. Army uh, Special Forces Green Berets, U.S. Secret Service agents, Homeland Security, and little girls and boys starting at the age of five. Who better to be the CEO and co-founder of the Blind Judo Foundation? Mm -hmm. Wow. And that's the individual who coached Lori Pierce in 2004. Wow. That's the individual that brought home gold for America uh, at the 2000 Games in Sydney, Australia, mm. at the Paralympic Games. Gold medal in the sport of judo for the U.S. has never been won since judo was introduced in 1964. Wow. Except by our Paralympians in 2000. Now, it might change this year for the sighted United States Olympic judo team, but from 64 to today, gold has never been won by the United States Olympic Judo Team. That's except amazing. Except by the U.S. Paralympic Judo Team. And there's the disparity. U.S. Judo, or Paralympic Judo Team? What's Paralympics? Hmm. That's amazing. You see the problem and the opportunity? Sure, yeah. sure. Yeah, and Ron, just, just speaking of that, it, it just uh, brought a question to mind. Uh, when we look at America, we generally stand... Uh, at the front of rights for for people, and so I'm 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 curious. Uh, in other countries that may not necessarily uh, do as much for the blind, are they uh, not participating in the sport because of political and cultural uh, situations elsewhere, or are we seeing? kind of robust participation from around the world, or is it limited to certain countries, uh, perhaps democracies, in fact, that that offer and preach liberty and therefore embrace what a blind competitor can do and are willing to support that? We get competitors, well, I shouldn't say we, the Paralympics gets uh, competitors from all over the world. We compete uh, I think Jordan, I, I could be, she has a better recollection than I do off the top of my head, but she's been to, I think, Uzbekistan. Uh, she's been to Turkey. She's been to, uh, I think, Venezuela uh, and other parts of the world. Mm-hmm. Keep in mind now, she's only 22 and competed against people from around the world. Yet athletics you probably know this yourself, athletics to some countries, those are full-time jobs. Mm-hmm. They give you apartment, they give you, you know, all sorts of other benefits because you're there to represent the country. And so, yeah, it's not as prevalent as from the sighted standpoint, but it's still prevalent in the visually impaired or blind community. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Ron, are we going to see you in London by any chance? Well, I was thinking of going, but then I, I go back to the premise, can I take falls for the athlete on the mats? Well, they won't let me in the Olympic Village because you either have to be the coach or the team leader. And can I provide any uh, additional added value? And I came up with the conclusion that I can't. Uh, it's pretty well controlled as far as, you know, security, and not that I'm a security at risk, but security and Olympic Village and all those sort of things. So. Probably not. I would like to catch up with you in person, whether it's over coffee or, a, or a breaking bread together or what have you, but I probably will not be going to London, at least as of today. I know that Paralympians are not um, supported by um, sponsors and, and you know, perhaps the Olympic Committee, et cetera, um, and I, I, I still have a very hard time actually accepting <laughs> that 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 happens, and so I know you know the Blind Judo Foundation is providing a tremendous service to these athletes. 
Um, and so I'd like to find out a little bit more about the sure. support that you provide and how our listeners can help support you support the athletes. Oh, very nice. Thank you. Uh, just a, a, a modification of your, your statement about uh, funding and so forth. Once uh, an athlete gets to a certain level through so many tournaments, gains so many points, and it's looking like they probably will go on and, and get accepted accepted on the um, on the team, then funding starts to come. But there's still okay. uh, a, a big gap there. For example, one individual who is going to the Paralympics uh, and, and competing on the team uh, and female is uh, she had to go to a tournament in uh, Texas. Oh, through that, probably four weeks or so ago. Well, the organization uh, that sponsors all this and the official link to the USOC didn't have the funds to send her. Mm-hmm. Pick up an airline ticket. And so we were contacted and saying, hey, could we help out this particular individual? And we did. We, we secured uh, the full price of an airline ticket for her to go round trip to and from uh, her residence uh, to to Texas to compete. And she won down there and got accepted on the team. Mm -hmm. Now, if that individual was an Olympian, we would never have gotten a call. And not because we're not involved with the Olympics versus the Paralympics. It's all covered. And this is is the difficult thing to, to comprehend because there is no difference between an, a, a Paralympic judo player and an Olympic judo player in the United States. Mm-hmm. The only difference is they can grab the other person's uniform. That's it. And, and so as far as, you know, support from um, listeners, what, um, I mean, the, the obvious is, is money. Um, and I would imagine your website has a, uh, a donation button uh, or some some form of um, uh, communication that you know um, we do. encourages uh, or you know um, streamlines donations. Um, yeah. But what other support is needed? Well, let me let me finish uh, answering your your original question too. Our fund. No, first of all, no one gets a salary at the blind. Gym. No board member or anybody helping us gets a salary or a stipends or anything of that sort. So it's not like you know we're going to make more money individually because we get more money coming in or money coming into the foundation. So I think that's nice for people to know from a uh, you know a, a bottom line basis. But our money comes from parents, from uh, people that. Uh, know about the Cahill's Judo Academy and the quality of of Willie Cahill and all that he's done. We get sometimes sponsors, and when I say sponsors, usually it's donations. And it could be $1,000, it could be a couple thousand dollars. We've got individuals that, uh, uh, not a lot, that uh, uh, can afford to, to donate more to the foundation. And because we do, we have we are an IRS uh, nonprofit and have our uh, our uh, tax exempt number, people can claim this as a donation on their taxes. Mm-hmm. So that helps. But all of it comes in through donations. And I give talks and, and so forth. One can donate right on our site, the blindjudofoundation.org forward slash. I'm just pulling it up now. Forward slash well, support. We- We'll have a we'll have a link to um, Blind Judo Foundation on your guest page and and also on um, this show page and uh, you'll certainly do our oh, part in, in helping to um, raise awareness. But uh, Ron, it it has been a pleasure and again you are a true ambassador for global citizenship and appreciate the the legacy of positive footprints that you're leaving. Oh, thank and you. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, it's been my pleasure. Thank you to both of you for what you're doing and how you are making a difference in the world. It's greatly, greatly appreciated. God bless you guys. Bless you. Thank you so much for joining us today. If you want more of World Footprints Radio, including our World Footprints Travel Report, giving you the latest breaking travel news, visit us at worldfootprints.com. While there, make sure you subscribe to our newsletter and follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Pinterest. We're Tanya and Ian Fitzpatrick, and we'll see you on the air again real soon. 
And until then, we wish you blue skies and purposeful travel that leaves positive footprints one step at a time. Blog Talk Radio, where millions of hosts and listeners gather.